Okay, this is the eighth video in the uh, series on chemical reaction engineering. We're going to talk about multi-step reactions today, and particularly reactions in series. So consider two reactions that occur in series, A goes to B, and then following that, B goes to C. Uh, we would typically find these written in this form. Uh, A goes to B goes to C with the rate constants written above the arrows, K1 and K2 in this case. So as written, uh, this might appear to be a very, very special case that describes only isomerization reactions that occur in series. Uh, however, in, in practice, this A goes to B goes to C situation is, is actually quite applicable to a lot of things. And that's because we don't actually care so much about balancing the individual reactions. All we really mean by this is that there's a first order uh, reaction that takes us from a, uh, a species A, and maybe it consumes and makes some other things along the way, but it gives us a new species B, and then again by first order kinetics, uh, that, that species B gets converted along with perhaps some other reactants uh, and some new products, uh, it gives us a species C. Okay, so examples of this are uh, taking uh, ethyl alcohol and oxidizing it to make an aldehyde, uh, and then that aldehyde can further oxidize. So this is sort of a partial oxidation step right here. And then that aldehyde can further oxidize to make two carbon dioxide molecules. Uh, Professor Scott and I have studied another example of these, looking at uh, methyl rhenium trioxide, where it reacts with uh, peroxide, gives you uh, back a water molecule in the process, and leaves, leaves behind this, this uh, this methyl rhenium trioxide with now an oxo group has been replaced by a peroxo group. You can then go on and do that again to this complex and get two peroxo groups on the, uh, on the rhenium atom. Uh, so it, it, it turns out that this reaction is, is actually reversible, but uh, that's, that's irrelevant for today. We're going to think about these reactions as just each stage being re irreversible uh, generation of a new product and uh, two reactions happening in series. So, oh, I'm doing that, that mistake again with my buttons. I'll try and stop doing that. Okay. Uh, so I already mentioned that, you know, usually in practice we don't really care if these reactions aren't, uh, aren't balanced and completely detailed and maybe we're not keeping track of some of the reactants. Uh, what matters is that there's a first order reaction that takes us from A to B and then to C. Okay, so at constant volume, the rate laws, uh, and perhaps, again, because of these things that we're ignoring, these rate laws are pseudo first order kinetics. Uh, but, but we can write down, for, some, for some, uh, some kinetic processes, we can write down the derivative of A with respect to T is minus K1 times A. Uh, it's only being consumed by the first reaction, right, species A. Then species B, is being made in the first reaction and consumed in the second. Okay, so it has a K1A uh, is, a, is the generation of species B, and then the consumption of species B is this K2 times B. And then the last reaction is only being made uh, from species B, so it just has this generation term K2 of B. So eventually, this is an irreversible process, and everything will end up in state C. Okay, so. Uh, there are a few ways to solve ODEs like this. You can use Laplace transforms. Notice that every one of these equations is linear. It's a system of, of uh, three variables, uh, and they all involve linear ODEs. Uh, you can also set this up as a matrix, and you can find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that problem. Uh, that works perfectly well as, as well. And in fact, this is a powerful trick for doing problems as they get more and more complicated. Uh, Laplace transforms will get will get quite messy when you have 100 species. Uh, you can also go on and just do stepwise substitution, right? Notice in this equation that you can solve the first one without thinking about what B and C are doing, and then once you've got the first one, the uh, time-dependent concentration of A, you just have a inhomogeneous equation to solve for for the concentration of B, and then once you've got the concentration of B, you just have a direct integration to do to get the concentration of C, okay? So in principle, you could just chug through this thing and, and solve it. So uh, it's not a math course. I am not going to go through the details of how to solve these equations. Uh, you, you can, uh, of course, always go to Mathematica, and it will solve such problems for you. Uh, the answers for the initial condition 
where everything starts as reactant A, and you have no B and no C in the reactor. They are given this way. You have a first, uh, a first order decay of species A uh, from concentration A naught through this exponential uh, decay term. Then you, then the in the second stage, you're you're making B, but you're also consuming B, and those are competitive processes. You can see uh, two exponentials playing a role in here one corresponding to the generation and one corresponding to the consumption of species B uh, and the solution for uh, the concentration of species B then is this. Notice that this is always guaranteed to be positive because whenever this quantity is negative this quantity will also be negative. Okay, so, uh, so there's no danger here of this expression giving you negative numbers. Uh, the uh, concentration of C once you know B and A is, is just uh, they you know, A, B, and C always add up to the total amount of stuff that you put in the reactor at the beginning. So I've, I've sketched the behavior of this, these uh, kinetics for the kinetics uh, showing the time-dependent concentrations of the three different species for each of these different cases, okay? So in the case where the second reaction is much, much slower than the first, the first reaction basically proceeds to equilibrium, or to completion, I should say, uh, and and you haven't really started making much C yet. Uh, now, that happens by having a big spike in the concentration of B, and B basically takes over the entire concentration by this point, right? So the reaction one is basically done, the second reaction hasn't started yet, and uh, over very long times, uh, the, the concentration of B begins to decay away and give you very slowly this concentration of B. So this is this case. At intermediate cases, where all the where the two rate constants are, are comparable to each other, you have uh, A starts to decline by its exponential decay, and B starts to rise. But as B starts to rise, you start to build up a concentration of B, and then the second reaction kicks in, and the concentration of C starts to rise. And what happens is that B passes through a very clear maximum concentration uh, somewhere around the time uh, somewhere around the time where uh, a and C cross over. Okay? Uh, in, the, in the last case that's important, you have that the second reaction is much, much faster than the first reaction. And what happens in this case is that A, as A declines, uh, as A decays by this exponential uh, decay that we can derive, uh, you find that you start making B, but B doesn't really live for any substantial time. As soon as B is made, it's converted into C. Okay, so it roughly looks as though B is not even there anymore, and, uh, and A and C are basically adding up to the original total concentration because B only makes a very, very small contribution in terms of concentration at all times. So uh, what if we were charged with taking a situation like this and maximizing the production of B, for example? Okay, well, uh, we would have to think about two quantities, yield and selectivity, okay? So if B is our desired product and C is not in the previous example, then it's not really enough to just think about how much A we've converted, right? So obviously if we wait long enough, we will turn all of our reactants into something else. But we want to choose the appropriate amount of time, for example in this case, uh, such that we've made a lot of B and very little C. Okay, so we have to think about both yield and selectivity. These are two slightly different quantities. The yield of species I is the total amount of species I formed divided by the initial amount of reactants. Uh, the selectivity can be defined in two ways. It's the uh, instantaneous selectivity is the rate at which component I is generated divided by the rate at which all of the other products, including I, are generated. Uh, the overall selectivity is where we don't think about the amount being generated at any one moment, but rather we think about as the it integrated over the entire process of the reaction, how much I did you produce, and what was the total amount of all of the other products that you made. Okay, so these two things are very, very closely related, uh, but sometimes they are different. And, uh, and so now we can look back at our, uh, at our you know, case where the rate constants were approximately the same, and we had reactions in series, A going to B, and B going to C, and we can ask, what time corresponds to the maximum selectivity of B? I'll give you a minute to think about that. And the answer may be a little bit counterintuitive, 
because I will just give you a hint, it is not this moment when you cross through the maximal amount of B. Remember that what we want when we talk about selectivity is to make B and not make anything else. Okay, so, uh, so there is in fact a very clear definition to this moment in time and uh, based on this, these definitions, which actually for this case turn out to be the same, uh, it's, uh, it, it's you know, straightforward to figure out what that time should be. Um, what time corresponds to the maximum yield of B? And again, this is related to this total amount of species I formed divided by the initial amount of reactants. Okay, so here we're not directly penalizing the formation of C in any way. We just want to get the most B out of the reactants that we use. Okay, so again, this one has a, uh, a very, very clear definition that we could use to go through and find this. Uh, may, may be a little, little more difficult on this one to actually point to a specific number uh, because of the qualitative nature of this chart. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and talk about parallel reactions. So if we now consider two reactions, A goes to B, and also A goes to C, uh, these things are both consuming the same initial reactant. They have different rate constants, K1 and K2. And let's suppose again that we have a desired product B and an undesired side product C. Okay, this occurs in many reactions. Quite often, you know, when we say that we're converting uh, A into B, uh, we're also making some junk that we didn't want. For example, when we dehydrogenate alkanes, uh, that process competes with coke formation, so we can get the olefins and the hydrogen that we intended to get uh, out of the alkane dehydrogenation. But we can also see those alkanes break up into smaller hydrocarbons, and, uh, and of course that's going to require some hydrogen and leave behind some residue of, of carbon that's uh, often known as coke on the catalyst that will, that will eventually poison our catalyst and prevent things from working. Uh, Professor Ford converts lignin into various chemicals. Uh, I have not written down their formulas here uh, because I can never remember these things, but uh, there are a lot of different side products in the reactions that he looks at. And, uh, and so, you know, the real challenge to try and figure out what those are, how well you can make them, which one of them has value for products. Uh, if all of the rates in a, in a process like this are first order, then we can write the, that at constant volume, we have the derivative of the concentration of A is the sum of the two rate constants that are consuming A multiplied by its, by its total concentration. Uh, and then we also have that the rate of production of B is K1 times A, and the rate of production of C, our undesired product, is K2 times the concentration of A. Uh, we, we know that the initial concentrations of A, B, and C add up to the concentrations at later times. Uh, we always have one species going to one other species in this case. Uh, and the concentrations as a function of time, we can actually go through and again solve these differential equations. Remember we had three relatively simple differential equations to solve here, and uh, those give you these functions of time for A, B, and C. Okay, so notice A has this uh, exponential decay with rate constant K1 plus K2. And uh, also B and C are described uh, by e exponentials involving rate constants K1 and K2, but we make less of them in the prefactor because this is the selectivity split. This is, this is saying that a fraction K1 over K1 plus K2 goes to make B from A, and the other fraction, K2 over K1 plus K2, is making C instead. Okay, so the selectivity is, as I've just mentioned, is the rate at which we make species B divided by the rate at which we make other species. Here's the rate of production of species B. Here's the rate of B plus the rate of making C. And all the concentrations of A cancel for these two parallel reactions and give you just the ratio of the rate constants, K1 over K1 plus K2. The yield, if we uh, look after the reaction is complete, is uh, the initial concentration of A times K1 over K1 plus K2, this is the amount of B that we made, uh, divided by the amount of reactants that we put in, and the A naughts cancel, and lo and behold, again, for the parallel reaction, we find that the yield and the selectivity are the same, okay? Uh, remember that this did not happen when we looked 
at this example of a series reaction. Selectivity and yield were, were going to be two different numbers. Okay, and we didn't really specify what that selectivity or yield was. That was a little puzzle for you guys. Uh, so more complex situations can, can be solved. Uh, things like this, where you start with, uh, with A, and you oxidize that to make B, and then B can go on and further oxidize to make CO2, or perhaps there's another pathway by which you can just directly oxidize A to give you CO2. Uh, this would have a uh, differential equation describing the rates given by, by this here. So notice that every one of these is a overall second order term where we have first order in reactant A and first order in oxygen. And you have these terms as well uh, that are taking the secondary product and further converting it. Those are first order in uh, reactant B and first order in reactant oxygen. So we can ask questions without doing any numerical work about what is the relative selectivity uh, to the intermediate B. Okay, so this is the rate of production of B, and notice we have the uh, both the rate at which B is being generated and also the rate at which it's being consumed. We have to consider that. We can't, if the rate at which it's being consumed is always equal to the rate at which it's being generated, uh, then we don't actually have any, uh, any selectivity towards B. There will never be any in the reactor. Uh, okay, this is the uh, net rate of generation of B and the net rate of generation of C. Okay, these two terms over here. Notice that we have a cancellation between uh, this K2B times oxygen term and the K2B times oxygen term that generates uh, C from B. Okay, so uh, the selectivity of B then simplifies and gives you this equation. We can divide through by A and see that there we really don't have to think about the separate concentrations of A and B to identify the selectivity. We only need to think about the relative concentration of B to A. Uh, and, and of course, there are some rate constants involved in that selectivity as well. That's it.